Okay, thank you, Ellison. Uh, kids can make their way to uh, Children's Church if you'd like. And that's kind of heading out to this door over here is the kind of the best way to go. If you want to do that, you can head down uh, either way. John chapter 12, if you have a Bible, uh, John 12 is where we are. We're ending the apostles today, and we're ending on a high note. It's Judas. That's fun. A Judas goat. Does anyone know what a Judas goat is? The, the, the phrase? Uh, what's that? Cheese? Judas goat cheese? That sounds delicious. It's the hair growing on the side of it that especially I like. No, Judas goat, uh, it's an animal that leads other animals to slaughter in a stockyard, is a Judas goat. A Judas kiss is a slang that people use. It's a kind act that ends up kind of a stab in the back. It's a Judas kiss. And of course, Judas priest, it's a group. Uh, it's an explanation of disgust. It's the contrast to Jesus. And that's the subject today is, is Judas out of John 12. And to imagine that Jesus' elite 12, that he had one, he had a Judas, this guy, is pretty amazing. If Jesus had one within his 12, wouldn't it be likely that we have one? That's what we're going to do today. We're going to pick out who they are. Is this fun? Is this going to be like the greatest Sunday ever? You can nominate people. This, could, this can't go wrong. I, don't, I can't see how this could possibly be a bad idea. Um, but, but instead of that, I have another idea. It's that we look at this subject and look within ourselves to see if there is an aspect of ourselves within the traits of Judas, because he didn't end up this way like instantly. He made his way to become what he became, and there were signs of it along the way. And there's signs within us along the way. And so the title is Judas Potential, that we kind of all have a Judas potential within us. Years ago, I read a line um, by an author, 1800s is when he said this, and it was, it's an idea. Grab this idea. He says, whenever you read the Bible and there's something good about mankind in it, immediately say, mm, that's not me. And whenever you read something in the Bible that says something bad about mankind, immediately say, mm, that's me, because you'll probably more often be correct. I read that. Soren Kierkegaard is the one who said that. And I, I read that, and I went, oh, let's work from that angle. I want to be when it's good, but I need to honestly say, but yeah, but am I? Could I be more so? So there's some traits in Judas because it's such a caricature of bad that none of us are there. I mean, we're just not that. But within us can be some of those same traits that if left unchecked, could get us there. So why not look at them and see where we can kind of cut those off? So a passage, uh, there's a couple great ones on Judas. It's uh, John chapter 12, if you have a Bible. You could turn there. It's worth seeing this live. And it's the story of Mary anointing Jesus at Bethany. We get a window into something here because Mary broke open some really expensive ointment and put it on Jesus' feet. Great act of homage and respect to Jesus. But then in verse 4, John 12, 4, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 
He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Think this through. Apparently, he said 300 denarii. A denarii was, a denarius was a day's wages for just a laborer. This was an expensive break the ointment open thing. I bought um, a Mont Blanc cologne. You know what Mont Blanc is? The pen? The mountaintop? Exactly. So I bought it on, uh, on Wish. That was the big first mistake. And let's be honest. How many of you order on Wish? Or what's the other one that's like that? Sheen. Sheen. Oh, Sheen is another one. Good job. I'm proud of you. Sort of. Um, so, Amazon. Oh, yeah. Just plain old Amazon. So I bought a Mont Blanc cologne, and it was because it was like really cheap. I, I can't believe I didn't save it. It, it was this big. Because it had a picture of it. It had the white top, like a, uh, the Mont Blanc pen. And I'm like, this is so exciting. I can finally have this really expensive cologne. And when it came in the mail, uh, the kids couldn't stop making fun of me. And Grant had it in his hand. He goes, this isn't really a bottle of cologne. I said, no, it's not even a tester. It's the right shape. That's what was going on. It was the most expensive ointment poured out onto Jesus' feet. Judas speaks up. This is a window. We learn a couple things in this passage. He speaks up and goes, whoa, 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 that's wasteful. We, you imagine the poor that we could take care of with that. Very judgmental. Didn't even mean it. The text says, but that's not what he was worried about. He was a thief. And you're like, oh, okay, so he was bad. No, no, it's worse. He was in charge of the money for the disciples. And he used to take from it. This is a picture of who Judas was, which raises so many questions. Couldn't Jesus have switched and had Matthew in charge of the money? But it was Judas. And they knew. They knew he wasn't honest. And that was Judas. There's a movement here. Money is a key piece in the story. Because that's our, that's our introduction to him. That's what we see. We'll see a little later where he's actually referred to as a son of perdition. He's referred to as the devil. Well, that could be a lot of subjects. But then at the end of the story, when he betrays Jesus, what did he betray Jesus for? Silver. is back to money again. That was a theme through Judas. Judas, as a name, is very honorable. It actually um, is... A half brother of Jesus was Judas. Um, that's the book of Jude. That little teeny book of Jude was another half brother of Jesus, and that's Judas is his name. This Judas, he saw a lot. He was standing there when blind men gained their eyesight. He was in the boat. When Jesus walked on the water, Jesus was, Judas was there. Walked all over Palestine with Jesus for three years. He not only heard Jesus pray, he prayed with Jesus. This is really remarkable. He saw the love that Jesus had for people. He saw Jesus spend time with sinners and not sin. He sat and ate with Jesus over and over and over and over. He literally had the quality one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. He was called. He was actually selected by Jesus to join the twelve. 
It was so important that when, move ahead in the story, Judas is gone, the 11 didn't move until there was another 12th one selected. So it wasn't a haphazard 12. It was intentionally, these are the 12 I'm starting with. One goes bad. Nobody moves until he's replaced. This is Judas. And what I did at this stage was I realized, so far, I'm just like Judas. Called. I've seen him do a lot. Haven't you? Haven't you seen him show up? and take care of your family, a real tragedy that's happening, and yet he faithfully saw you through it, lovingly saw you. You've you've been there. You've experienced that too. We've benefited from knowing Jesus way more than we even know. Conflict in family, conflict from behaviors that the world does that we avoid because we do what Jesus has instructed. It's all for our betterment. So far, we're just like Him. But then there was this slippery slope. It's the second point in those notes. One was that he was definitely a one-time trusted member of the Twelve. The second is he was on a slippery slope, and he didn't seem to know it. In John 6, so this is earlier on, in John 6... John 6... Jesus is speaking. Go actually all the way to the main point, which is verse 70. Long chapter. Uh, In 68, Simon said, Lord, to whom shall we go? We have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas. So this is early on. Didn't I choose all of you? One of you is a devil. It's the where we get the word diabolical. It's uh, diabolus. And it could be a word that means slander, but one of you is a slanderer. One of you is an accuser. Well, that word became, you bec- you are now a noun. It's you're the accuser. You're, you're the slanderer. That's where we get the word devil. This is the word devil. So he pointed it out to him. He goes, yeah, 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 I get that. I, yeah, I am the Holy One of you, and I have called you, but there's one of you. I, I don't know what happened. But I have an idea. A little hard to explain, but it hits me close. Judas is chosen as a 12. Was he chosen to be the betrayer? No, I don't think that would be fair to say. He became the betrayer. He was chosen and had the opportunity to be just like the other 11, but he had different motives. Jesus' way of thinking is different and didn't buy into it. He didn't think the same. We saw that with money. His use of money was different than the way they were using money. He got to hang out and experience some of the greatest things the world has ever experienced. He was there, but it just didn't make sense to him. He didn't join in. A little abstract, but maybe this would help. There are those who will walk into a church, even commit themselves to be involved in a church because life's better for them 
I'm going to participate because because <clears throat> it's good for me. It's good for my business. It's good for the interaction. It's a healthy place to be. I'm following Jesus because my life is better for it. And the moment it's not better for it, I'm out. There are signs of that. So we're going through a horrible health situation and we're praying to God, make this go away. I I hate this. I don't want this to happen. Make this because I'm following you so I have a better life. And this is horribly painful. Genie, magic genie Jesus, come in here and fix this and make it right. In fact, I'm going to be stressed and anxious until you fix it. Doesn't that sound familiar? Rather than, God, I'm on a really difficult road here. I absolutely hate it. I do want you to fix it, but not my will, your will be done. I will endure and persevere as long as you want this to last. I'm content in my relationship with you. I'm not following you just so that everything is better. It's like we have a life that we have designed, basically built on pretty good morals, but a life we have an income and the family's mostly in control. We always have one crazy family member. They may not even know who they are, but we all do. So you've got all of this going on, and it's okay. And now I'm taking Jesus and kind of inserting him into it to keep things going the way things are best to go. That is acting exactly like the world, but it's using Jesus to think that you're accomplishing it. No, we abandon our life to him. Whatever you want. Oh, I'm going to struggle, and I'm going to fall, and I'm going to get mad, and all of that's true because it's the constant struggle of wills. My will for my life in your will for my life. That's always in conflict. And the Christian life lays down their will. And we say, not my will, it's your will. Judas was out of step. It just didn't make sense to him. Too much of the upside-down kingdom, you've heard that phrase, Jesus' kingdom is upside-down. This world says, be first in line to be first. Jesus said, no, the last will be first. Give up everything and you gain everything. Everything's backwards in the kingdom. And the world goes at it different. Break that ointment. Oh, that's a waste of ointment on him. And Jesus says, well, I'm only here like for a short time. Like, bless her for that. And even the criticism wasn't correct. Well, but we can give to the poor. (laughs) That's not what you would do with it. Anyway, your argument isn't even true because it's constant conflict, constantly going against and that was Judas. Jesus didn't come to fulfill your life the way you want your life to be. He came to rescue you from your life and what you think your life should be. I promise If we designed our life, it wouldn't go the way it's going right now. Am I right? It just, it wouldn't. But we've surrendered it to God and said, your will be done. I will follow your principles, and I'm trusting you with the rest of it. I'm letting go of all of it. Look at the consequences. It's the third point. Sin has consequence. And so does repentance. In the words of John 6 and John 17, we learn that Judas, what's called a devil, son of perdition, 
But that was his choice. I, God is sovereign. I, I get that. God is in control. And somehow we have still the freedom to do what we have chosen to do. And that's the path he chose. John 12 said he was a thief. He's flat out thief. I think there's a little bit, well, I think he was tricked. I think Judas was tricked. He had, they had no idea they were going to kill Jesus. Uh, I'm just going on record. I think that's true based on Judas's response by giving money back. They're trying to hunt Jesus down, and they can't figure out a way to get him. So he goes to them and says, what will you give me? I'll, I'll, I'll take you to him. And then you're going to question him. You may rough him up a little bit, get the, however they did a candle spotlight on him, and he's tied up, and they're going to ask him questions, and then they're probably going to let him go. So he goes, and they offer him money, and he goes, oh, this is great. This is easy money. Goes, points him out with a kiss. They take him, and then it's horrible. And Judas is like, what have I done? He takes his own life. He throws the money back and takes his own life. It's not what he signed up for. This, isn't, this wasn't the intent. All I was doing was going after a quick buck. All I was doing was a little bit of betrayal, whatever. That's not what a kiss is for. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, you use your, all your poetry lines. That was the easiest way for me to designate that's who he was. I got my money. But then they just took it too far. Okay, the lesson is so simple. Sin seems under control until it isn't. I, I, I bet you anyone in this room, I'm just going to say for fun, 50 and older, it could be 20 and older, knows and can give personal examples where sin being in control, I've got it under control. And it is under control. Well done. You're doing what's called sin management. Okay? I get it. Because you have a relationship with God, and you love Him, and you want to serve Him. He has saved your life. He's given you a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. That's pretty good. Got that going, but I have this little bit of disobedience going on the side because... I still want my life the way my life is. It's a battle of wills. But right now, the sin is manageable. It's not that bad. Nobody swindles out of the office 10 grand until they've swindled 50 bucks. I mean, that's just the way it is. We can get trite and say it was the swindling five bucks. Will everyone who swindles five end up stealing ten grand? No, they won't. But anyone that has stolen ten has stolen five. Because it's manageable. Lust, you have it under control. It's manageable right now. With the internet today, the things that you're viewing or listening to, it's under control. I've got it. Yeah, you absolutely do until you don't. And you have no idea how bad it's going to get. Because you're being set up. You and I are being set up by the evil one. I believe that Satan is as alive today as Jesus is alive. And Satan has the scheming to get you and I trapped in sin. <clears throat> and it's all fun and games until it isn't. And you're like, I can't believe how deep I just got in this thing. 
The drinking was so fun and it was under control and now it controls my life and I don't know how to get out of it. Because it's sin management, it's all okay until it isn't. Growing sin unchecked is not only a dark place to be, it looks like you're in the light. It looks like it's okay. You feel like it's under control. Until it's not. And then we find out how dark it really gets. Then eyes are wide open. That was Judas. Can't believe he did that. What? You want to slap him. Hey, I'm thinking of uh, <clears throat> just for a little bit of silver, going, Wait, I didn't even finish my sentence. No, I think I knew what you were going to say. Like, that's not, it's not going to give you what you think it's going to give you. Yeah, I think it is. No, it's not. That relationship that you're in that's unhealthy, it's unhealthy, and it's not under control. You think it's under control, it's not under control. It's just getting more and more of you, and then the problem. Then it shows itself. And Judas had it all under control. I mean, that was, he had that schemed pretty good. I mean, it was okay. He threw the money back at him. And they're like, we don't want this. This is you. We've already, we already got out of you what we needed. And what an ending. And I don't know what there might be in your life. <clears throat> the more insignificant, the more it's like, it's okay, it's under control, this is the one you want to talk about. That's ideal. Is it the one that you still think is under control? Take care of it now. You tell someone. That's a big piece. You tell someone. Have them with you go to God to repent and confess. And then you make plans to not do that more. The telling someone's a big one. Have you ever, this is going to be, this is fun, we didn't, we didn't, so I got to make this kind of, because we didn't get to pick out Judas's in the room. So I got to spice this up. <clears throat> like in your life, there'd be like a sin in your life that you've confessed like a hundred times to God and you just can't get rid of it. It could be small, it could be big, but you're like, I go, God, fix this. And then like, you're back in it within 12 hours, an hour. And you're like, what? It's because it's in darkness. Bonhoeff would say, you didn't even confess it to God, you confessed it to yourself. Little bit of a different subject. But what does sin hate more than anything? Light. Sin hates light. So you bring it to light. You tell somebody. So have in mind that, that sin that you think is under control. Have that one in mind. Imagine standing up right now and just telling us all about it. Well, that's in the old days. They actually did a public confession. And the reason was that the more, that more light that is on it, the more humiliation that there is with it, the less chance you're going to do that again. It just, you flip the light on and watch the cockroaches flee. That's why it's tell somebody and have them go with you to, with God. Say, hey, this is what I, I'm not sure, I don't think I should be doing this, and they will be non-judgmental, hopefully. And they'll say, well, let's go together to God and let's talk. And go to God and confess and repent. Make those plans to not be in it anymore. There was an artist that commissioned to paint in a Sicilian cathedral, the entire mural, like depicting the full uh, life of Jesus. And it took decades for this artist to actually complete this huge rendition. 
He discovered early on in in the city a 12-year-old boy whose radiant innocence just made the perfect model for little boy Jesus. And he's kind of known to have done this, that he bring this darling little innocent boy in and depicted this child, this Christ child. Years are going by, and this guy, the painting, and it's just spectacular. He's all finally made his way towards the end of the mural, and now he's actually to the point where he's got to figure out how to find a Judas. <laughs> and he, he goes out into the town, saw a guy staggering out of the tavern, hated to approach him this way, <laughs> like, hey, you'd be kind of like, you're kind of that rough character I'm looking for. He goes, yeah, whatever. He starts walking. They made their way to the cathedral, and he pointed inside to the bare space on the wall and asked him to pose, and he kind of apologized kind of for Judas. The derelict broke into sobs and says, you don't remember me, pointing to the Christ child. He goes, I was your model for the Christ child. If that isn't a familiar story, the innocence, the purity, and the beauty of walking with Christ with no shame and no humiliation, but that hidden sin left unchecked will make its way and will end up leaving its mark. So my encouragement to all of us, myself included, this isn't a me to you, this is from us to us. Sit with someone and just talk. Just say it. Say, ah, this is a little unchecked. Allow them to hear it and allow them to pray with you and break the patterns, break the patterns, because I do think as we look at the life of Judas that there is some Judas potential probably in all of us for us to recognize. Pray with me right now if you would. Heavenly Father, it's, it's, it's a heavy thought, and yet it's a very encouraging thought how free you are to accept us back into your fold, clean and cleansed and repentance. And I pray that this moment would impress, be impressed upon us in the hours ahead as we find that freedom to eliminate sin that seems so managed, to bring it to you before it isn't. In Jesus' name, amen.